Hi, welcome to our channel of IGNU Audiobooks, Indira Gandhi National Open University, School of Gender and Development Studies, SOBDS, Bachelor of Arts, Gender Studies, BAGS. Semester 3. BGS 005 Issues of Gender and Development. Block 1 Concepts of Gender and Development. Unit 3 Feminism in Development The Gender and Development Context 3.1 Introduction This unit deals with how feminism is integrated into development discourse and its concern in the gender and development context. Feminism and its relevance in GAP are discussed in this unit. Also, a brief note about a few gender and Development, GAD, thinkers is mentioned in this unit, along with a case study on policy analysis from a GAD perspective. 3.2 Learning Outcomes After studying this unit, you should be able to explain the influence of feminism in development discourse. Analyze the importance of feminism in the context of gender and development. And Examine the contribution made by thinkers of the GAD approach. 3.3 Feminism in Development Discourse How have feminisms influenced the development discourse? Feminist discourses are not just tactical but potent forms of interpretation for ourselves and others. When feminisms engage with development, we see the emergence of a coming together. A Coalition. We will now explore these discourse coalitions, Hajra, 1995, in the gender and development context. Some key arguments and debates are summarized in Table 3.1, elaborating on reconceptualizing GAD across three decades by Kelthi Kilben and Kavita Datain. Their paper on, From Feminism to Engendering Development. Table 3.1 Key Arguments and Debates in Reconcept GAD Argument Debate and Selected References Feminism no longer refers to a Western influenced, hegemonic set of ideas but takes a series of forms operating at different scales, whether local, national, regional, or transnational. Studs, 2000, Vargas. 2002. There is a need to foreground embedded local practices and the imbrications of local gender relations and ideologies. According to Place and Space. Afshir, 2000 on Iran, Kisby, 1999 on Zimbabwe, Robson, 2000 on Nigeria. It is vital to link local understandings with strategic commonalities among women, and men, in order to effect change, Raju, 2002. Northern and Southern Feminists have will be 2002. Called for forming alliances across space and place that draw on commonalities. Peak and trots 2002. Within the broad GAD framework, there is the emergence of the equality approach that promotes power sharing between the men and men as a fundamental human right marking a shift from needs-based approaches. Chant and Gutman 2000, Sengupta 2000, Mohan and Holland 2001. However, rights conceptualized in Western, individualistic terms may be at odds with many cultures in the South, where communal or group rights may be more important, Radcliffe 2002. Strategies are required that can transform rights into choices and concrete improvements in women's lives, Conwell and Welburn 2002, Harcourt 2002, Conwell, Harrison and Whitehead 2007, have focused on the importance of narratives advocating gender and development within development institutions. These 
narratives have helped to give an impetus to creating a cadre of professionals and a body of organizations of various kinds whose work deals with issues of gender. These authors emphasize that discourse coalitions have been constructed around particular feminist insights in the development discourse. What are these insights? Among the two most important insights are households are sites of conflict as well as cooperation and women face the double burden of productive and reproductive work. Now we speak of a triple burden including community management work. According to the authors, forging appropriate forms of solidarity across difference has never been more important than in the precarious geopolitical realities of the world. They suggest that attempts to redefine and reshape development intervention should be based on gender as an organizing principle in the development process. Gender, in itself, is one of the critical axes of difference in our societies. We may speak of the unifying experiences of all women and their solidarity. However, on further exploration, we realize that women's experiences may vary depending on the influence of other axes of difference. What are these axes of difference such as caste, class, religion and race can have strong, powerful influences. They may interact with each other to define how an individual is gendered in and by society. These axes of difference act together or in opposition. In some cases, they increase the influence of such difference. And in other cases, they shrink it. However, feminists advocate working for furthering the cause of women's empowerment in different contexts. Recognizing and bridging differences or, as Cornwall, Harrison, and Whitehead put it, forging appropriate forms of solidarity or oneness. Do you expect feminists engaging with development to have widely differing experiences? We need to acknowledge a wealth of experience spanning different regions and nations. Why? This happens because different material, political and discursive positions emerge from varying contexts. Putting gender on the development agenda may involve moving away from its original basis and aims. This is why we need to focus on crucial concerns of making the development process also an empowering one. It is interesting to explore how Gender has become represented by approaches, tools, frameworks and mechanisms in the mechanisms of professionalization and institutionalization. We must understand that approaches, tools, frameworks and mechanisms are necessary for practical applications. However, they should not be regarded as a mere technical fix. Instead, we should employ them as vehicles for women's empowerment. Some scholars have expressed concern that embedding in institutions, organizations, and bureaucracy is a part of the processes of professionalization and institutionalization. They comment that this can loosen the link with feminism while providing feminists with livelihoods, work, and, indeed, identities. Simultaneously, Conwell et al., 2007. What are the implications of these trends for development practice? Can we work on a transformative agenda? The answer is yes. We can strive for a more gender just society and seek to change unequal power relations between women and men. In order to enable this transformative process, feminists need to engage with development institutions in new, critical ways respecting and bridging differences with changing 
times, new terms and engagement frames need to be developed. What does feminist engagement with development involve? One of the primary dimensions has been emphasized as making strategic alliances and substantial progress in policy making. Understanding approaches such as get in simplistic terms has led to limited engagement in meaningful ways with framing and implementing policies, providing different understandings of how institutions influence outcomes and different views of the pitfalls and compromises of political engagement. When alliances are made, we must reflect on the cost of such an alliance. It is necessary to ally with organizations and institutions that share critical empowerment and development goals. Otherwise, we risk the dilution of the empowerment agenda and remain restricted in our role as change makers. When we talk of the interfaces of feminist discourse with the development agenda, there has been an increasing focus on the economic sphere. This focus can be attributed to the recognition that it is in this way that we see many of the changes associated with the freeing of agency from structure, Atkins, 2007, of what is often described as individualization. While individualization can be transformative, Atkins, 1998, argues that the organization of individualization may be central to the organization of gender oppression. Aming Abage may have transformative potential, but is it empowering in reality? This would have its basis in individualization and organization. Entering the workplace may add to a woman's work burden and shrink her time reserves without giving her real access to or control her earnings. Can you think of examples from our country where such a situation exists? Look at the informal labor market in our country and other developing countries. Do women working in the informal sector get the kinds of decent work as defined by the International Labor Organization, ILO, that they seek? Are they paid just wages with reasonable working hours? Are working conditions safe? Are they exploited? What are the implications of the argument we have just studied? Individualization need not change the status quo. The gendered structuring of the economic domain may maintain the existing gender-based division of labor. Individualization may accompany traditional forms of gender, particularly an intensified traditional division of labor. Evans, 2003, speaks of the shift in the 21st century towards prioritizing the workplace over the home, a reorganization of priorities operative for both men and women. Work brings with it routine tasks but often provides immediate and valued rewards. Compare this with the rewards in the household and family world. Here, the rewards are less assured and less tangible in everyday perception. Do we observe the same value being given to long-term relationships as desired? We may not. This can be directly derived from the lack of obvious and substantial rewards associated with such relationships and hence may explain the crumbling of edifices of home and family and personal networks. Evans argues that the world of aid work has become the focus for both economic and emotional reward. Pearson, 2003, states, being exploited by capital is the fate of virtually all women in today's global economy, arguing that wage increases will not make women either less poor or more powerful, peer synergies, minimum income, labor regulation and proper social policy as key feminist expectations from states, which should resource 
the collective provision of services and recognize women's representation. However, in the present context, can we hold states responsible or accountable for ensuring rights? Sikta, 2007, believes that in today's world, economic decisions are increasingly taken outside the effective control of the nation-state. In such contexts, it would be a strategic error to identify the state as the primary site of accountability that can deliver on rights. Increased informalization of the labor market makes state provision doubly problematic. Pearson, 2003, argues that there is considerable statistical, empirical, and analytical evidence to indicate its increased consolidation both driven and supported by patterns of economic globalization. Scholars such as Sikta, therefore, do not expect newer top-down rights-based approaches to deliver gender justice compared to previous top-down approaches. On the other hand, scholars such as Mukhopadhyay, 2007, argue in favor of the rights-based approaches. She states that talking about rights privileges women's identities. As citizens, Mukhopadhyay, 2007, rather than reinforcing identities as mothers, wives, and daughters, Lister, 2003, Mewit Seva, 2003. 3.4 Emerging Realities and Conceptual Frames after elaborating on these theoretical insights, let us examine practical realities in the Indian context. The last 25 years since the Beijing Conference have seen substantial progress in official, government, donor and NGOs, discourse on women's development. Ramjani K. Murthy and Mercy Kapen, 2007 have traced this change process. In the 1980s and 1990 as the discourse stressed integrating women in development, the 2001 National Policy on Empowerment of Women marked a shift with the discourse emphasizing the need for women's empowerment to challenge the socially constructed gender power relations between women and men. As the authors note, the policy speaks specifically about strengthening Indian women's and girls' positions with the women and boys. Government of India 2001. Gender focal points have been established in several social sector departments. Several ministries have a gender policy. Gender specific guidelines have been involved for integrating gender into planning and gender indicators for monitoring have been developed and exist in operational terms gender budgeting exercises have been undertaken by the indian government at the national level with the support of united nations bodies establishing the national commission for women promulgating sexual harassment at the workplace and legislation on the Domestic Violence Act are landmark interventions. We have briefly examined the government's response to the challenge of promoting gender equality. Let us now look at how Indian NGOs have responded to this challenge. Can we identify some responses from NGOs? Murthy and Kapen, 2007 differentiate between two types of responses. One setting up basic infrastructure for institutionalizing gender into policy and programs. They prefer the use of the term institutionalizing rather than mainstreaming since the mainstream may in itself be gender biased. To adopting organizational change approaches. What is the difference between these two responses? Rao and Kelleher, 2003, have used the term infrastructure to refer to systems and procedures. They suggest the 
term, organizational change, approach for more fundamental changes in NGOs usually. Masculine, decision-making and organizational culture. Let us also try to understand the difference between institutions and organizations. An institution is the framework of rules for achieving specific social or economic goals. On the other hand, organizations refer to the specific structural form that institutions take. Do you know the major institutions in society? Yes, you are right. Institutions include households, communities, markets, the state, Kabir, 1994, and interstate. Institutions, Murthy and Rao, 1997. Gender and power relations are reproduced through different institutions of society. This extended the earlier conceptualization of gender relations, interlocking with power relations of caste, class, race, age, religion, and ethnicity to maintain women in a subordinate position, Whitehead, 1979. Murthy and Kappen have elaborated on Andrea Cornwell's 1998 documentation of gender operating at the community level. Cornwell challenged the notion that gendered power relations were played out only in the relationship between women and men. According to her, the social construction of gender has a decisive role in some of the power relations between women and men. These power relations, in turn, keep women and girls and men who are sexual minorities, Dalit, laboring class, religious minorities, and differently abled in a subordinate position. Elaborating on this South Asian context, Murthy and Kappen talk of social construction relations between mothers and adolescent daughters, mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law, women with husbands and single women, women with sons and women without, upper caste women and Dalit women as cases in point of power relations between South Asian women. They also give examples of power relations between men, such as relations between who are sexual majorities and sexual minorities, fathers and sons, upper caste men and Dalit men Muslim men. The authors argue that power relations between women and between men have as much role to play as power relations between women and men. In the persistence of gender inequality, Marty and Kappen have suggested that organizational changes include making organizations more democratic, promoting flexible working time and space. Accommodating women employs reproductive roles, increasing the voice of women, staff in decision-making, increasing accountability to women clients and building alliances with leaders of women's movements to create demands for organizing change from outside. As Murthy and Kappen have explained, several of the gains in institutionalizing gender or mainstreaming as we usually refer to it, have been possible because of the windows of opportunity heralded by the Fourth World Conference on Women at Beijing, 1995, International Conference on Population and Development in Cairo, 1994, and the Vienna Declaration on Violence Against Women, 1993, as well as informal mobilizing structures through alliances between the Indian Women's Movement gender advocates, in donors, politicians and bureaucrats and gender advocates among NGOs, Button and Pollock, 2002. If you noticed, our discussion on the gender and development context has focused on the binary frame in both sex and gender. Box 3.2 tells us about some emerging conceptual Frames which move beyond the binary frames of sex, male-female, and gender. Masculine-feminine. 
we must address the challenge of incorporating concerns beyond the male female and masculine feminine binary conceptual frames the range of masculinities also needs to be explored however essentially the gender and development discourse focuses on women men and development and seeks to promote gender equality and equity by mainstreaming gender into institutional practice why is this so this emerges from applications of gandan practice to most population groups in any country region or local setting the mainstreaming process should extend to all marginalized groups where the context requires it nevertheless in most contexts women remain the most underprivileged and marginalized how have development agencies donors training ngos gender focal points mainstream gender within development organizations these intervening agencies have been guided by the infrastructure rather than the organizational change approach some donors have attempted to change the organizational culture of quasi governmental organizations by recruiting ngo workers and middle level staff into the quasi governmental organization murti 2005 how does the infrastructure approach work in practice the organization's vision and mission are preserved and insulated from change changes are made instead by institutionalizing gender into the baseline data gathering planning monitoring and evaluation and human resource development systems as well as organizational structure government line department's mission is often sectorally driven agriculture health education ngo missions conversely are either sectorally driven or issue driven reduction of poverty reduction of violence against women furthering reproductive rights what should be the ultimate goal of mainstreaming gender in development organizations we must seek to foster progressive changes in the gender discriminatory rules practices and allocation of resources and power within households communities markets and state and neoliberal interstate institutions we need to place gender infrastructure in organizations and foster organizational culture change the latter is a complex contested terrain and indeed challenging to achieve as you know organizational change processes need to be reshaped by strengthening the position and representation of women staff within the organization and responding to new demands from the field emerging from the challenges to gender discriminatory institutions as murti and kapen put it gender infrastructure and organizational change processes should be accountable to women's strategic gender interests and marginalized men's interests they suggest combining institutional organizational and infrastructural approaches to gender mainstreaming if you recall we have emphasized the central role of organizational and infrastructural change supporting institutional change favoring women and marginalized men box 3.3 encapsulates the gender and development approach for quick reference box 3.3 gender and development the gad or gender and development approach emerged in the 1980s as an alternative approach to women and development with women and development word and gender in development gid it has a theoretical root in socialist feminism it has bridged the gap left by the modernization theorist by linking the relationship between production to the relation of reproduction and taking account of all aspects of women's lives 
socialist feminists have identified that the socialization of production and reproduction is the primary rationale for women's oppression. Thus, the GAD approach focuses on social relations and questions the roles given to men and women in different societies. According to the GAD approach, roles assigned to men and women in different societies were due to the socialization process. And from this, oppression begins, and this can be changeable. Although the GAD approach does not question the significance of more fabulous women's participation in social, the economic and political life of society, the primary concern of the GAD approach was why women were oppressed and why women were systematically assigned secondary roles in society. The socialist feminist combined their analysis with Marxist feminist analysis of patriarchy, and they attempted to address the concerns of women. Kate Young identified some of the critical aspects of the GAD approach. Perhaps, most significantly, the GAD approach starts from a holistic perspective, looking at the totality of social organization, economic and political life in order to understand the shaping of particular aspects of society. GAD is not considering women in isolation, but it considers the social construction of gender and the assignment of specific roles and responsibilities to men and women and society's expectations of men and women. However, radical feminist considers female solidarity and emphasis. Female exclusion in contrast to radical feminists, the GAD approach welcomes the potential contributions of men and women who share concerns about equity and social justice. The GAD approach does not consider women's and men's productive and reproductive activities and lives exclusion of the other. It analyzes the nature of women's work and their contribution within and outside the households, which includes non-commodity production. According to GAD scholars, Third World, women perform three roles which include productive, reproductive and community managing work. Reproductive work includes childbearing, child rearing and caring work. Productive work includes secondary income earning activities and community. Managing works provide and maintain scarce resources for collective consumption, such as water, fuel, and common property resources. GAD approach rejects the public private dichotomy that is commonly used and undervalues women's contribution to the family. Apart from that, family is considered a private sphere, and the state's interference with the family is commonly opposed. Both socialist and Marxist feminists give importance to women's status in the private sphere, and it gives attention to the women facing oppression in the family to analyze which conjugal relationships are based. Gad also emphasized the state's role stressing that the state should also promote women's development and contribute. GAD approach clearly states that women are active participants in the development process rather than passive recipients of the state and other agencies' welfare measures. It gives importance that women should come forward and mobilize collectively to raise their voices. It recognizes the importance of both class solidarities and class distinctions, but it argues that the ideology of patriarchy operates within and across classes to oppress women. Socialist feminists and researchers working within the GAT perspective are exploring both the connections among and the contradictions of gender, class, race, and development. The GAD approach focuses on women's legal rights, measures to be taken by the state, i.e. affirmative action.
and tools to be developed to integrate gender issues in policies and programs. It also stresses the importance of increasing women's percentage in all legislative bodies. GAD wanted to re-examine the social structure and institutions and the changes to be brought in the existing structure and institutions to bring gender justice at all levels. In all the structures and institutions, which ultimately brings a shift in power relations. GAD also talks about the commitment of states and other agencies to bring structural change at all levels. States and agencies following the GAD approach developed tools to integrate the GAD approach into their policies and programs like gender budgeting, gender mainstreaming, affirmative action and gender analysis. Gender Mainstreaming talks about mainstreaming gender in all policies and programming. From legislation to implementation. Gender analysis examines how power relations within the household interrelate to those at the international, state, market, and community levels. Gender analysis is based on the GAD approach. This involves promoting equality between men and women. The key is placing the issues that women say are of particular concern to them and the main agenda of those institutions which shapes women's and men's lives, the state, non-government organization and so on. As the above said tools, states are committing themselves and taking affirmative action to bring changes in the existing social structures and institutions. Let us now give you an example of how to analyze a scheme from the GAID perspective. Box 4.5 Box 3.5 An example of analysis of scheme from a GAID perspective. In this context, it becomes pertinent to analyze the impact created by the much acclaimed National Rural Employment Scheme NRAGS, of the Government of India. Renamed as Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Scheme, MGREGS. This unique government scheme, introduced in 2005, aims to provide a legal guarantee for 100 days of assured employment per year to members of rural households willing to do unskilled manual work at the statutory minimum wage. As such, Riga should work as a safety net for rural people by enhancing their livelihood, security, employment possibilities, and purchasing power. Even though women's empowerment is not the primary agenda of NREGS, provisions like a priority for women in the ratio of one third of total workers, equal wages for men and women and gracious for the children of women workers ensure the availability of opportunity for women to benefit in a particular manner. The program has been designed to enhance women's independent access to work opportunities and income. An increase in women's income is widely reported to improve the health and education outcomes of both children and entire households. A study on the empowerment effects of the NREGS on women workers in the states of Bihar, Jharkhand, Rajasthan and Himachal Pradesh argues that women workers have gained from this scheme primarily because of paid employment. Opportunities and benefits have been realized through income consumption effects, intra-household effects and the enhancement of choice and capability. Income Consumption effects mean an increase in the paid income of a woman worker and consequently increases her ability to choose her consumption. This choice is significant because if a woman earns but cannot exercise any choice on how to spend her earnings instead if she should give her total earnings to the head of the household. She does not influence the spending decision at all means missing empowerment. Women have also gained to some extent in terms of realization of equal wages under NREGS, 
with long-term implications for correcting skewness and gender. Discriminatory wages prevalent in the rural labor market of India. Nevertheless, the study also stated that NREGS had brought some difficulties and obstacles for women in terms of increased working hours, vanishing of their leisure time, and they have to bear with physical and emotional strains. Lactating women and women with young children work under emotional strain as they remain separated from their children for long hours. Some adolescent girls are reported to have left their studies for job opportunities under NIGS. Apart from these, only a minimum representation of women is there among the functionaries of NREGS, like program officers, Rosgar Sewaks, ombudspersons, and members of vigilance and monitoring committees. Source Ashul Pankaj and Rukmini Tanka, Empowerment Effects of the NIRGS On Women Workers, a study in four states, Economic and Political Weekly. Wall XLV No. 30, 24 July 2010. 3.5 Let US Some UP. Feminism in Development Discourse was discussed in detail in this unit, apart from Stating the contribution made by a few gender and development thinkers like Caroline Mosa and Naila Kabir. This unit of this block has been added to provide a comprehensive look into the GAD framework, making it easier to understand the following units. Enhance women's independent access to work opportunities and income. An increase in women's income is widely reported to improve the health and education outcomes of both children and entire households. A study on the empowerment effects of the NIREGS on women workers in the states of Bihar, Jharkhand, Rajasthan and Himachal Pradesh argues that women workers have gained from this scheme primarily because of paid employment opportunities and benefits have been realized through income consumption effects, intra-household effects, and the enhancement of choice and capability. Income Consumption effects mean an increase in the paid income of a woman worker and consequently increases her ability to choose her consumption. This choice is significant. Because if a woman else but cannot exercise any choice on how to spend her earnings instead if she should give her total earnings to the head of the household, she does not influence the spending decision at all means missing empowerment. Women have also gained to some extent in terms of realization of equal wages under NREGS with long-term implications for correcting skewness and gender. Discriminatory wages prevalent in the rural labor market of India. Nevertheless, the study also stated that NREGS had brought some difficulties and obstacles for women in terms of increased working hours, vanishing of their leisure time, and they have to bear with physical and emotional strains. Lactating women and women with young children work under emotional strain as they remain separated from their children for long hours. Some adolescent girls are reported to have left their studies for job opportunities under NIRGS. Apart from these, only a minimum representation of women is there among the functionaries of NREGS, like program officers, Rosgar Sewaks ombudspersons, and members of vigilance and monitoring committees. Source, Ashul Pankaj and Rukmini Tanka, Empowerment Effects of the NIRGS On Women Workers, a study in four states, Economic and Political Weekly. Wall XLV No. 30, 24 July 2010. 3.5 Let US Some UP. Feminism in Development Discourse was discussed in detail in this unit, apart from 
stating the contribution made by a few gender and development thinkers like Caroline Mosa and Naila Kabir. This unit of this block has been added to provide a comprehensive look into the GAD framework, making it easier to understand the following units.